All right, let's get started. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, it's actually nine, but I guess um, most of you are from Ahmedabad uh, meetup um, because I think um, that's where we actually posted. Um, but um, this particular event is actually part of the um, Golang India Remote Study Group. Uh, we do have an official repository um, that we had been maintaining since before the pandemic. We also used to have a meetup group, but that unfortunately got removed. Uh, so do follow this particular repository for any further updates or any new meetups that would happen. Um, the idea was that um, Remote Study Group is going to be um, kind of like is going to be slightly different than meetups in format. That is, here we would not really have talks. Um, so we would rather have more of an exploration phase itself. Um, that is, today we are going to be talking about eBPF and how we can work with eBPF in Go. So there are a few, few different libraries that we would be exploring. And um, here it's going to be a very um, non-talk session. Um, so you it's not only me who's going to be talking, but uh, we'd get everyone involved in some way or the other. So if you all have Linux machines, that would be great. Um, that that means that you all can potentially run um, the samples that we have today, um, the guide that we'll be following today. Uh, but if you don't, uh, maybe you can look at what eBPF is, um, how we can leverage that and go, and we can get started with it. So my name is Gaurav Agrawal and I've been a, a part of the Golang India um, Remote Study Group since 2018, 19 is when we started. But um, due to the pandemic, we kind of uh, suspended it and we kind of are resuming back into the Remote Study Group itself. So a quick round of introduction would help. I guess we do have a small group. Um, so just to um, just to set context, I would like to know um, where are you from, um, how, how long you have been working with Go, and if you have actually worked with eBPF before, or what made you interested in eBPF itself, or this particular session. So uh, probably I'll nominate the first person, um, Dharmit. Dharmit, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, hey, I'm Dharmit, and I'm based out of Ahmedabad where I run the Golang Ahmedabad meetup group. Um, just recently started reviving it because just like Go study group, it was dormant since a long time. Um, this is only the second meetup since. Uh, so yeah, it's sort of a, whatever you want to call it, a collab or a cross meetup, anything. Oh, I noticed yep. you were you were doing something like this and uh, we have a small mini meetup kind of thing happening. And Ahmedabad, we are a small group of people who are meeting on a semi-regular basis. And a bunch of us were, discussing eBPF, you'll find a few of them here right now. And um, we were really interested in it. And I think before I noticed your uh, ping on the Slack, I proposed that maybe I'll do a talk on eBPF with Go using the exact same guide that we are gonna follow today. Yeah. And yeah, this was a perfect opportunity. So and working with, I'm working with Go since about four years now um totally in love with that language at the moment um i haven't worked with ebpf but the capabilities and whatever i have read about it it's what's got me excited about learning more about it um would you like to nominate the next person like just random. sure uh cavalier uh, I was not ready for this. Sorry. Oh, that's uh, okay. If you don't want to um, share uh, yeah. video, that's yes, also fine. I, yeah. So I am Kaivalya. I'm a, I am a DevOps engineer. Um, I work with uh, Google Cloud and Kubernetes. Um, I, I have basic Go exposure, uh, but nothing uh, uh, like not even intermediate. Uh, and I just know about EBPF like conceptually, so I wanted to learn more. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Did you say you are working with GKE, um, like Google? 
Yeah, Google Cloud and, and Kubernetes. Yes, yes. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Um, probably I'll nominate the next person. Munir, would you like to go next? Like we'll do a quick round. Um, like. Hey. Um, I don't think I can hear him. Um, what's up? Would you like to go next? Mm, yes. Audible. Go to. Yep. Uh, yes. So I'm. Uh... Full stack software developer and currently working as a developer and uh, have basic exposure in Golang and uh, yes, want to know more about eBPF and uh, haven't got to know anything about them on hands on practice. So, looking forward to gather some knowledge about that. Uh, Vivek, would you like to go? So, hi, Ron. Great to see you all guys here for a Golang meeting. It seems much casual than the formal meeting that we in the events and all. So I think this would be a great and uh, great to start with. So let me introduce. So I uh, I'm Vivek from Indo. Uh, I recently contributed to I work not today. And in, it is basically in Golang. So I have been working with Golang from last two to three years. And currently I'm working on a software supply chain security project so yeah kind of and i have a uh, bit knowledge of EBP. it is kind of uh, javascript in, in a web development similar to ABP of in a program where you in a linux kernel where you can drive your own program and you have it has many use cases it still is in its uh, i think initial phase there are a lot too much to discover about EVPF. So yeah, okay, that's all about this. Thanks, Vivek. Sandeep, would you like to go? Um, I think uh, we have Dhaval. Hi, Gaurav, and hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for the two faces here. Actually, I'm projecting uh, this meetup on my screen, two screens, okay. but uh, somehow company and mode is not available for this meetup. So I have to log in in two different systems. Uh, so uh, Dharmit was talking about uh, this local uh, small group that uh, we are running. It's called Tech uh, That's where uh, we talked about EP EVPF. I have had uh, somewhat uh, uh, professional usage of eBPF tools from Brandon Girls repo uh, while uh, uh, finding or debugging some performance related issues, but mm -hmm. uh, not that much. Most of the time I was just uh, carrying out some syscalls and creating flame graphs without affecting the running system. But uh, I have never delved into uh, actual uh, coding of the EPPF program. And that is where I am very much interested. Vivek, I am also learning or uh, you know, trying to uh, dangle my feet in supply chain security. So would love to connect you outside of this group as well. Uh, would love to know more about how to do supply chain security and uh, fix lots of stuff around that. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, mention what I do. I'm a DevOps engineer. I mostly do consulting right now, uh, based out of Amazon only. Uh, that's me. Thank you. Um, I think we have Kalapa Shaker. Uh, would you like to go next? Hey, hey, all. yeah. So uh, I'm working the technically on a company, Venison Technologies. So where. I work as a Golang developer last four years. So yes, I have worked with EBPF on that project somewhere. So there we used to monitor a lot of uh, system calls. So they want to basically they want to build an observability platform over there where uh, they want to see the everything there. Like if any file is open or closed, any process is open or closed, something kind of that, right? They want to send everything to the user space and user space in the cloud and and in the data they put everything in database and let it they can uh, see over the data of what happened to a process, what happened to a file, how much time it is. So all these kind of things. I have worked on them in the past for this, but uh, yeah, 
uh, not from the so I, I don't know from the C side because there has to be some system called extro expro cap carrot probe all things are there inside the in the inside the C also I don't know about that things like that that is handled mm -hmm. by some separate team but the, from the go side I have little bit idea about the PF where the code works how the code works yeah nice interesting um I might have some follow up questions for you um when we get started. But um, I guess we'll just get started. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction as well. Um, so like I said, my name is Gaurav Gral, and um, I've been part of the um, Go Golang India Remote Study Group uh, for the people who are just joining in. Um, so I've been working with Go since 2014. Um, I started with Go um, to stress test UDP networks. Since then, I've worked with uh, RESTful APIs, GRPC, GraphQL. Um, I've also trained a lot of people in um, Go as well for the course of my career. Um, I currently do run Kodamana Technologies. And today uh, we are going to have a, have a um, session where we are all going to be following along a guide to um, compile our first EBPF program and interact with it using Go itself. So um, before I get started, um, I guess many of you are already aware of it um, that eBPF is a Linux only technology. So let me just uh, note down some of the um, key points with eBPF before we get started. So eBPF is essentially a Linux technology. Um, it kind of uh, is an extension of Berkeley packet filter. So that's the technology which predates um, eBPF itself. And if you have ever used something like Wireshark, um, you kind of have been using um, things like BPF, it says. So, B, uh, so Wireshark is basically um, something which lets you capture uh, packets. It lets you um, see what's happening within those packets, it says. You can um, look at the, you can basically look at all the interactions which are happening with your machine, it says, from the network, in, with, with the network interface, it says. So um, eBPF kind of came out um, as an extended Berkeley packet filter. And the idea was that um, instead of recompiling the kernel, in order to make any change, um, they came up with um, the idea that you can have a eBPF sandbox, which is running within your kernel itself, within the kernel space, and you can load dynamic programs uh, that is you can have some um, C superset applications um, so eBPF is actually usually written in C itself and it's not just C it's actually a superset of C and it allows you to um, load that particular program into your um, eBPF sandbox within your kernel which allows you to run applications within the kernel space itself so one of the typical applications of it was network filtering itself. Um, so one of the most popular projects out there, I think, which uses eBPF is Cilium. So if you're already on GCP, um, if you're already using GKE, you're probably already using Cilium itself, or you're already working with eBPF uh, without you knowing it. Itself. So there's a bit of an abstraction over there um, with eBPF, but it does still work. So you have a sandbox um, at the kernel space itself. Now, the reason um, eBPF actually became popular was because uh, one, it allows you to do a lot of advanced tracing and uh, networking itself. And the other was that it allows you to also um, write more faster programs because they tend to run within the kernel space itself. So your packets need not even get passed around from your operating systems kernel space onto the user space itself. So that was kind of like the um, quick overview of eBPF itself. I hope I have not made any mistakes. Um, so this is again not going to be a talk, uh, but we are going to be following this particular guide. Um, so I have compiled some of the program already, um, but I hope everyone has a Linux. Anyone who does not have a Linux, please do let me know. So maybe you can watch what's happening on my system. So Cilium has this particular um, project called eBPF Go. Um, Cilium itself as a project is written in 
Go. So Cilium is actually a CNI, um, a container networking interface um, layer that you can use along with Kubernetes itself. So if you have heard of Calico, if you have heard of, um, I forget what is the other, what are the other examples, but essentially if you have, um, yeah, I can't think of other um, CNIs, but you can use Cilium as a uh, way to talk to uh, the different pods and the nodes within your Kubernetes cluster itself as a layer which allows for the communication itself. So Cilium itself is written in Go and um, the developers of Cilium actually wanted to interact with eBPF a lot. In fact, um, Cilium itself is heavily uses um, eBPF under the hood along with it being written in Go. So that's kind of where this particular eBPF Go library comes in. So they kind of introduce this, this particular library um, to interact with EPP, eBPF itself. So um, my goal here is to explore this particular library, um, first of all, and look at alternative libraries as we go forward, as we, as we move ahead. So this is a very simple um, getting started guide itself. Um, so the eBPF C program that they have here is a simple counter. So it's literally going to count the packets. Um, so th they are using li Linux BPF, BPF .h, um header file. So you kind of have some prerequisites that you'd have to install on your machine before you get started. So if you're on Ubuntu, uh, these are kind of like the dependencies that you'd have to pre-install on your machine. I hope everyone has. You are not on Linux. In case if you don't have Linux, um, the easiest thing to do would be here, um, do a Docker run, Ubuntu, Bash. I think um, there's nothing easier than that. So you can kind of do the, do whatever um, that I'm going to be doing on my system. So I do have a Linux server or Linux, um, system in front of me, I'll actually be running the program on that system itself. Um, so once you're done with installing the dependencies, do let me know, we'll move ahead. So mainly, um, you'd need LVM, um, and Clang because we would be, com uh, compiling this particular C program itself, which is what the counter.c file is. Um, and we also would need libb libbpf itself because we would be we would be importing this particular uh, bpf header file in our C program. Apart from that, this um, this is basically uh, I had this particular error on my machine. Um, but if in case you don't have this particular error. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and talk out out loud because otherwise I would not have an interactive session and I would not where you are. So um, if you have reached to this particular level, do let me know that you have a Linux system and or at least a Docker container running on your machine. Docker or Podman, whatever, um, some container with a Linux no, um, eBPF would not work on Mac. Or even on Windows. Um, actually, I'm not sure about Windows, but um, there's a Linux subsystem, but I don't think they would have implemented um, eBPF in it. Most likely, Windows would not have. BPF. Interestingly, um, Windows does have BPF support, um, just not eBPF. But apparently there is eBPF for Windows as well, which I did not.
Interesting. Um, so it's using a hypervisor. It's not really eBPF on Windows. So there's no real um, eBPF support on Mac OS. Um, there is eBPF on. So the thing that we are doing right now is uh, make sure you have some Linux environment set up. Um, my recommendation is to use Docker itself. Um, just do a Docker full Ubuntu the worst case scenario. So if you get Docker working on your system, I would definitely recommend um, do the run if 90 RM because you don't want that particular container lingering around. But uh, once you have that particular container up, you can go ahead and install the dependency. So I have created a repository um, as well. Or to demonstrate this particular eBPF. Guide. This is like the simplest EPF guide that I have. So on Ubuntu, you need these dependencies. Just let me know as soon as you have these dependencies installed. I guess that would be yum and yeah, it would be DNF or yum, whatever. Just to want to, uh, you know, caution everyone that if you are using Docker mode, then uh, we just check it out that if you are using Docker desktop or uh, you have Docker CE installed. If you are on Linux and you are using Docker CE, then everything you are doing is actually doing in your own kernel. If you are on Docker yeah. desktop, uh, then you are using uh, the VM which is created by Docker desktop. It won't have the direct access to your actual kernel. So that would be uh, better suited uh, to experiment it right now. So you, you are essentially loading a program into your kernel, even though it's sandbox. So um, do follow Dhaval's uh, advice because if your kernel, um, like you are probably not going to break out of that particular sandbox, but you still don't want any privileged program to be running within your kernel, any arbitrary program run within your kernel. Um, though it's not going to be, um, too bad because this particular counter.c program that we have here, um, it uses BPF um, in order to just count packets, automatically increases a packet counter on every invocation. So even though this particular um, .c file, um, it is a .c file, it looks very different than usual C programs itself. Like For example, when you see this particular struct, um, you have these dunder, um, types defined and here you have a BPF map called a uh, packet count. Um, so you have a struct called packet count, which is an array type map holding a single U64, U64 value, uh, which is the BPF uh, map type array, which is the max entries itself. So for this example, we went with an array since the well-known data structure you are likely familiar with. In BPF, arrays are pre-allocated and zeroed, making them safe and ready to use without any utilization. So unlike um, C, which has garbage values, eBPF programs do not have garbage values. So um, the thing is, uh, we are writing this particular program, but loading in into the kernel is going to be something which we can do via the eBPF Go library itself. So in order to compile this particular program, um, you would still need a BPF to go uh, scaffolding. So in order to um, take a eBPF program, you can generate a scaffolding for it using the BPF to go um, command line utility. So one way to install that would be, the easiest way to install that would be to do go install itself. 
just do a go install uh, with PPF to go. Uh, as well as once you clone that particular repository, you'd also have to do a go mod download or rather actually just um, CD into that particular uh, repository once you have cloned it and do a go mod down download in order to get all the dependencies. So that particular um, mod file already has a dependency on Cilium eBPF, which is um, this particular command, which is where this particular command is from. And um, it has some indirect dependencies itself. So nothing really uh, major that we are downloading except the Cilium's eBPF library itself, which Cilium heavily depends on. So once you have this particular library, um, you should be good to go. Um, so they do have, so the documentation does say that you can create a gen.go file, which is just a go generate command, which allows you to com compile your um, counter.c program into a go program itself. So you're just transpiling that particular program. So right now in this particular directory, I had created the counter.c file and this particular gen.go file itself. So counter.c is our eBPF program and this particular gen.go file is essentially just this particular go generate command itself. So once you have these two, um, you can directly run this particular command as well, or you can just use go generate in order to generate um, certain files itself. So as you can see, it does not run on my machine. First of all, I don't have LLVM strip on my machine. I think I did install it. Um, but anyways, even if I do, um, I still don't have libpf, um, that is the libbpf on my machine itself. So I'd actually have to do it on a Linux machine. So I fortunately do have one lying around. So let's get into uh, particular directory, and I have already pre-compiled this particular program itself. Sorry, um, let me just yeah. So let me um, remove the untracked files. The generated files, I'm just removing them. Let me just do a git checkout to get back to the um, repository itself. So the default of the repository itself. So I just have this particular counter.c file, um, this particular gen.go file with the um, requisite dependencies itself in the go.mod file, which is the eBPF um, transpiler itself from Celia. So once I have this particular dependency, um, I can go ahead and run go generate and this goes ahead and generates a bunch of files. So apart from this particular counter.c file, I have a few other counter files which are being generated. So we have this particular um, bpf eb, uh, bpf.go file, um, object files, bpfel.go um, and object file it says. So if you go back to the um, guide, it does tell us that we have a Docker is not working on my system, so I'm not worried about that. But um, um, here I have this particular counter BP FEL file. Let me actually show you the contents of the files. My machine. Okay. You know what? I'll just. Um, get into the GUI of this particular machine. Um, I do want to, what's there? Um, So let's, um, so if you look at these files, um, these are the two generated .go files from the um, BPF2Go 
program itself, from the command line utility itself. So if you look at this particular um, EL file, it has this particular data. Data object that we had created, that we had defined in our BPF program. So let me have this particular counter.c also open. Um, so if you look at the counter.c, we have our packet count itself. So if you look at this particular EL file, it has the count packets, um, the counter programs, which is actually automatically generated. So counter program contains all programs after right, um, different keyboard layout. The counter program contains all programs after they have been loaded into the kernel itself. So um, we are actually going to be interacting with this particular eBPF program through the generated Go API itself, uh, which, which has been generated through the BPF to Go. Any questions so far? We have this particular EV file and the EL file. Um, actually, not completely sure of the differences between these two files because they do look pretty identical. So, why they generate two different versions of it? And I don't think the guide also talks about it. So it automatically generated a scaffolding for interacting with account packets program from Go. In the next step, we'll show how to load our program into the kernel and put it to work by attaching X XDP hook itself. So XDP is um, essentially um, it, the yeah, express data path. So express data path is something which gets loaded into your um, NIC. Um, it's actually pretty closely related with your network interface card itself. Um, so it allows you to hook um, not only at a kernel layer, e eBPF as a program, as a as the technology, not only allows you to have hooks within your kernel layer, but it can even hook into your NIC itself. So you can sort of, um, anytime a packet hits your network interface card, it would get it would actually hit this particular express data path itself. So the eBPF program can intercept those packets itself. So this can reduce your latency uh, whenever you're dealing with any packets. So with, with this particular Go program, we are going to be loading this particular um, generated eBPF program into our kernel itself. Let's do that. I already have this particular main.go file created, which has our program itself. So once we have this particular program, actually let's look at it also. Hey, Prince. So if you look at this particular program, um, the main thing here is that, um, yeah, you do need to have a particular minimal Linux kernel version. That is, um, you'd need to have 5.11 above. Um, otherwise, you'd have to use um, our limit memlock to control the maximum amount of memory allocated for a processor's eBPF process. So it's, it's set to a relatively low value, um, but we can change this. Um, so we are removing this particular memlock itself. Uh, we are initializing this particular counter objects, which is a result of loading the um, generated code itself. So I don't have to load that particular generated code explicitly or import that particular generated code because they are all part of the same um, package itself. Since in Go, um, you can split your program across multiple files. They can be easily accessible if, even if they are part of different files in the same directory. 
they just need to belong to the same package in order to use those objects there. So this particular counter objects is from that generated code itself. So it contains a struct, um, is a struct containing null pointers um, to map and program objects itself. So we can look at that within uh, this particular file as well. But you have this here, um, so I can look at that particular counter objects, which has this particular program and its maps. So BPF program is generally um, has a program and a map. The map is a key value store, which allows you to um, store any particular data, which the program is using. So with every run of that, that particular program is essentially going to be in a continuous loop um, kind of thing. And it can use that particular data, which is actually stored in the map itself. So using this particular counter objects, we are just loading a particular object. Um, load counter objects function, we are loading this particular object success. And we are deferring this particular objects dot close to should, so that this particular um, file descriptive can close before the Go application terminates. Um, and we are interacting with the H0 interface test. That is uh, my actual physical LAN test. So once I have that, I'll be attaching my XTP, XTP program. Um, that is the count packets program will be loaded, will be linked first of all to the network interface card itself, which I can then close. Um, like which I'm ensuring gets closed if um, my program terminates using defer. And this particular program is going to continuously every um, second, so every second, I'm just going to um, look up the packet count and display it. And in case if I get a stop, that is if I get a um, OS interrupt, then I'm going to stop the execution of this particular program itself. So this particular program is kind of going to um, use this particular BPF program, which is already part of the kernel, to look up the current value of that particular packet count itself. So that particular eBPF program is going to be continuously running. Um, that is not something which I'm actually controlling here. I'm only looking up the value which is stored within that eBPF, which is being uh, updated by that particular eBPF program itself. So let me try running this particular um, program on that machine. So I have not done this before. Um, so here goes nothing. So it seems like I do not have um, those programs, those things. Ah, that's because uh, when you're doing a Go run, um, you cannot provide just this particular main.go file. I would actually kind of have to provide this particular directory in order to load all the code within this particular current directory itself. Now, if I do that, um, it seems that this particular mem block operation is not permitted. I wonder if the guide is suggesting a sudo. Yep, it is, fortunately. So I'll have to uh, do a sudo run on that particular program itself. So let me just do a sudo. Sorry, I'm kind of switching between um, two different interfaces. So I'm just running the same program via command line itself. So I'm just going to do a sudo in order to run this particular program. Um, give me one second. I just wanted to check my um, network interface. I think it should be at zero. I don't know why it's not. That's completely weird. Okay, so I have Docker zero, um, loop back, and ENP um, fourteen S, which is actually my Ethernet. So I'm going to use this one instead. Let me change that program.
So um, let me actually make some network requests. That's strange. Um, yeah, demo issues, I guess. I think it was the inter different interface, the WL one. Um, that one had an IP assigned event that will point it out the same, I think. Yeah, the WLP15S0. Oh, okay, so yeah, it's not. Okay. I'm actually connected via Wi Fi, I guess. But a VM doesn't see a Wi Fi, right? A VM would. No, see it's a... not my VM. Um, this is my oh, actual okay. physical machine. <laughs> then it makes sense. WL. Let me kill that particular program. Um, let me edit this particular profile. Yeah, I'm actually running this on a physical machine, um, which is right in front of me. Not my Mac laptop, but um, I do have a desktop which I'm using for this particular demo. Um, seems pretty foolish, but I don't suppose it's going to hurt my system because I'm in control of this particular demo. So. Um, I'm just trying to get that particular name again. It's 15, I see. Really? Okay. So um uh, WLP team S zero. And now on cool. So I do get a count of all the packets which are um being sent and received from my system. You know, it doesn't seem much. Um but this is the simplest eBPF program also that we can run. Now, the key thing here is um, even more than the go part, um, it's actually this particular counter.c itself that we have written for writing our eBPF program. So, so this is actually doing that particular um, count update. Um, so it is doing that particular count packets to uh, keep track of all of the all of the uh, packets which are hitting your network NIC. Um, now, writing eBPF programs itself, um, like this particular .c file uh, itself is, I've, I've, I've met people who have um, been writing eBPF programs that is um, actually working with the .c files itself. And I haven't heard really good things from them because it is actually pretty hard to debug eBPF programs, um, especially if you're writing them from scratch. Um, but apparently, apart from um, this particular this particular um, library, there's one other which actually allows you to write it via libbpf go as a wrapper. So with libbpf go, um, you can kind of get this particular map. Um, you can update it, but um, you kind of transpile this particular Go program into a eBPF program, which you can then load it into your um into your um um into your kernel it says so libbpf go uses cgo to interrupt with libbpf and will expect to be linked with e libbpf at run or link time and simply importing libbpf go is not enough to get started you'll need to fulfill the required dependency in the following ways so libbpf has to be installed on your system already on your linux system before you can use this so this is completely different than the um, Cilium back project. Um, this is actually, uh, this is something which I coincidentally came across just a day before. Um, this is by Alpha Aqua Security um, Company. I've never heard of them before. But um, libbpf go is actually pretty popular. Um, surprisingly, a lot of projects are tending to use it under the hood. 
um, you have this particular um, trace agent, um, which is doing that again, um, kind of like at a packet level. So Aqua Security has this um, flagship project called Tracy, uh, which is kind of the Linux runtime security and forensics using eBPF. So it's open source. It's pretty cool to check it out. And it's all written in Go. So very little C uh, when compared to many other eBPF projects, itself, which tend to have a lot more C than Go itself. Go is just for loading and run and perhaps getting that um, information from that eBPF program itself. But Trace C uh, seems to be a, a lot more different than many other programs out there any other packages out there. Um, so this was a quick demonstration of how eBPF works. Um, but I have no idea about that, Sandeep. Would you like to elaborate on that? So, um, yeah, we all know about that particular CrowdStrike outage, which happened, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, uh, yeah, even I don't have much idea except for the few lines. Like, uh, apparently, they said that like once the eBPF for Windows is out, then it will prevent the recurrence of this issue. Like, the faulty kernel files could be better handled. But I, I don't know the deep. I mean, I don't know in dupe, how is it going to prevent? Um, so I think the problem there was um, that the CrowdStrike um, outage actually caused the Windows kernel itself to panic because they had this particular um, API being hit from their kernel load time. Um, and I think with eBPF, they can sandbox that. But I'm still not sure if it's a good idea to hit your um, third party APIs from within your kernel and expect that there would never be an outage again from this side. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. That's one way I can think of. Yeah, I think um, that's all I had for this particular demonstration. So one of the other things which I would have loved to do is um, um, for everyone to actually come up with um, different kinds of eBPF programs itself, but I think we have like seven minutes. I don't think um, that would be possible. But definitely do explore eBPF a lot more. Um, so I think the de facto site, which is out there, eBPF would help you in writing more better C programs itself. So anyways, if you have to write any um, production grade um, system with eBPF, so there are a lot of forensic applications like uh, Accuracy Circuit, Aqua security that you can see, uh, which does use eBPF heavily. I think wiz.com um, also generally tends to use eBPF. So wiz, um, I think they recently had an offer of 23 billion from um, Google, um, but they kind of rejected them. Um, and they are kind of like the number one cloud security company out there right now. So they have been using eBPF under the hood as well. And they came out of kind of came out of nowhere. Um, so I mean, eBPF is pretty revolutionary. Um, yes, um, eBPF programs should be written in C, um, or rather they would be loaded in C. So it's not exactly C, it's actually a superset of C. Um, so whatever you can do in C plus um, some weird syntax as well. So for example, here you don't see uh, uint directly. It's kind of like uh, under uints for some reason. Hello. Hey, baby. Uh, so I have to doubt. So basically, we have written the main program that which is counting the packets in C language, and after that, we ran that. So we did not write any main function oh, oh, here. If you look at this particular program, mm -hmm. um, 
in this particular counter.c it's not a normal c program at all in any respect um like if you try to run it using the c compiler it won't mm -hmm. run because yeah. not compatible so uh, the, the main functionality which is counting the packets is written in this uh, counter.c yes so, so this particular function the count packets function is doing that particular counting Okay. So the thing here is that you're loading it in XDP itself, the express data path. I okay. can show you some slide um, which I had just to explain um, where exactly it would be loaded. I think it's an older slide. I had a training where people are. I don't know. Okay. So if you talk about, um, sorry, uh, yeah, I think we have to. Yes. Okay. This is the one. Hmm. So this does talk about Cilium as well. Uh, but essentially, you have your BPF program, which can be loaded within the kernel, um, within the container as well. Or it can be loaded directly in, onto your network interface card itself. So that's what we are trying to do here. So um, with the network interface card, we are entering something which is known as um, XDP. Hmm. I have a. So Express Data Path um, is a hook at the earliest point possible in the networking driver and triggers a run of the BPF program upon packet reception. So this happens automatically. So basically, we are hooking our program to an inter, uh, interface. To a hardware, yes. OK, whenever any something uh, packets go, goes from that interface, our program will be triggered, and it will run, and it will count the packets. Yes. So. Exactly. Okay, I understand this part, but basically my doubt was that okay, after writing um, so after we after we have written counter dot c program, we have been written we missed means copied copied that part, and then we ran that command go generate go generate to command. Hello. So we ran go generate uh, command. So after that we get bunch of files. So is that kind of can we say that? Uh, those counter dot c file is kind of converted into golang file automatically after running go generate so the thing which is still going to be loaded into your um, kernel is your counter dot c file hmm. so this exact program is what we are going to be loading into our kernel it says the only reason we have these particular generated files is that um, we want a way to interact with that ebpf program um, which is already run running within our kernel itself. So okay. using this um, generated code, we are um, interacting with the counter objects, um, loading the counter objects, and then um, dictating the interface that it's going to attach to, and then linking this particular program onto the interface itself. Okay. But that's the main purpose of this particular transpilation itself. Otherwise, we can also directly load XPPF program. Um, then what's the role of Golang here while creating eBPF program? I see we are using Cilium, which is written in Golang. Um, is it the medium we are providing to interact with the kernel and eBPF? Um, kind of, um, yes. If it's written in any other language, will it be possible to do the same? Yes. Um, so lib. Um, so Helium has not taken any effort for anything other than Go, but Aqua Security does seem to have. Um, I just saw a lib BPF RS was there. That is, there's a Rust based library as well. Okay, so that's by libbpf. And the people behind libbpf 
So you have LibBPF, uh, which has uh, findings in Rust. So I think even the Linux kernel is starting to move towards Rust. So we'll see a lot more Rust-based libraries out there. But I don't think there's support for any other programming language, which can load your eBPF program easily onto the kernel. So the Linux kernel does expect eBPF program to be loaded in the form of bytecode. So it's not even the C program as such. Um, it has to be transpiled into a bytecode or compiled into a bytecode and then loaded. So I think there's a whole other process to do it. We just did not have to do it because we are doing it via Go itself. So you, that's why we kind of had to use Clang in order to generate that particular object file itself. The object file is our um, compiled, compiled bytecode. So we are at time here. Um, I hope this particular session was useful at least to clarify a lot of things with eBPF. Um, so I have been using only the network or this particular demonstration has been only around the network interface part of things. But um, I think like how Vivek mentioned, um, or I think, sorry, um, Shaker had mentioned, like in their company, they had been using it for uh, OS level, like process level. Um, um, information. So all of that, uh, like you can have hooks at a program level itself that you can um, do. So the slides which I had for Cilium are actually not really uh, created for this particular talk. Um, for this particular demonstration, it's not supposed to be a talk, but I think we kind of ended up having a talk itself. Uh, but I think the next time we can actually uh, be writing an eBPF program from scratch itself instead of um, following a guide. But yeah, I'm just sharing the slide link in the chat. Hey, Dhawal. So, uh, Gaurav, uh, I would love to know, you know uh, have you seen uh, anyone uh, writing eBPF for their professional uh, work, but not as a vendor of uh, tooling uh, which uses eBPF, but actually uh, some company who is using it in some custom way, not as a, a vendor? Um, so VMware uses it. Um, so I have um, had a chance to interact with uh, participants who actually were writing eBPF programs in a job and then learning Go. So VMware is one company, um, at least it has employees in India who are, who are writing eBPF programs. I don't know any other companies, but I'm sure there are many. Um, security is definitely one big place of where eBPF programs are used. Monitoring is one other place where eBPF programs do find a lot of use. But I don't know any company um, in India which is actually using it. But there are definitely, um, I think I showed two, three examples already. Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Uh, I was just wondering that uh, if there are any uh, non B two B tooling kind of people, uh, how they are using it in the consumer grade. I, I have yeah yeah I have used BP, eBPF uh, through BPF dress uh, uh, online uh, and uh, for you know as a replacement of system tab and dtrace. But uh, I have not seen uh, anybody using it uh, professionally in their day job, whether they are uh, running infrastructure or uh, whether they are doing DevOps kind of thing. So this was a unique thing that I've seen. I want to learn more about it, but I'm not sure uh, who to speak to because uh, there are not that many people talking about it, uh, how they are using it internally. That's true. Um, even a lot of people who were uh, building things in the monitoring space um, uh, of Indian origin, and whom I talked to, weren't really interested in eBPF for some reason. Um, 
I couldn't gather get, gather that their thoughts on why they weren't um, using eBPF, but to me, it's it kind of seems um, likely that you'd end up using eBPF as, at some point of time. You really want something at the kernel layer itself um, to be interacting. So, yeah, if you are in those particular industries, if you're in those domains, um, monitoring anything where you want to know. Um, the health of your application itself, um, kind of, you are going to be uh, building products around B2B space itself. I don't think eBPF would be, I doubt it can be used for um, B2C. Um, maybe you could have, so, um, there is one other technology which is kind of um, interesting, which is kind of anti antithetical to um, eBPF, which I had come across. I think that's DPDK. Um, this has more um, consumer grade uses, usage actually. So the idea with um, DPDK is that you're kind of moving your data plane from um, the kernel level to the user level. That is, you're completely skipping your packets going to the kernel space somehow. Um, so there is a DPDK version for Nginx. They use DPDK a lot. DPDK also. Yeah. What team do you belong to? Okay, so basically we're into network security kind of. We're building products for the clients for the area of network security, right? So you used yeah. to deal with like the EBPF kind of things a lot. I have personal involved in EBPF things around two projects, okay? And a DPDK, I have around involved around three projects in DPDK. So we use DPDK a lot in our daily life. Yeah. So mainly the network is where you where user wants more performance kind of thing, thought talking because the when you use DPDK, right? They, they, they do, don't use user space kernel such that kind of thing, right? Directly data will be moved towards the data integrated that data part pipeline, right? So we use a lot of things in DPDK around DPDK. I kind of didn't get that last part, but um I think that. Like again, I, which organization do you belong to? Uh, I belong to Benison Technologies. Yeah, this is network security kind of organization. Yeah, appliances or um, software. Actually, we do have different kind of things. So we we have our own development who is pro, who is uh, manufactures out uh, all these things, and we have a service person organization. So where uh, we do provide services to our client on the network networking space. I just want to clarify one thing. Isn't DPDK's whole purpose was to uh, streamline the network driver space? So, uh, you know, if you have a network intensive uh, workload, you don't need to uh, go through the default driver set, which is uh, there with the kernel. And you can easily skip the, those things, mostly used a lot at uh, uh, financial institutions for their trading purposes and all. Uh, I have a little bit of uh, exposure to it, uh, but that was very brief exposure for a couple of weeks. And uh, not being a programmer, uh, I couldn't understand the depth of it at the time. But I am not sure, is it uh, related to EBPF or not? Because they no, both... It's not. Uh, yeah, both of them uh, started completely differently. DPTK is very much uh, driven by Intel, if I recall correctly. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't know that. So I didn't know it was backed by Intel. Um, but yes, you are right that um, DPTK and eBPF do not share um, a lot of things on with each other. But um, somehow they do overlap in their use cases. Um, so. DPTK does um, skip the kernel layer, the kernel drivers, and um, you can use your own custom driver implementations in the user space itself. So there is kind of a, a port for Nginx um, using DPDK. User space TCP IP stack is what they are using it, using for it. So this is also a very interesting technology, um, definitely not related to Go though. Um, so I wouldn't want to be talking about that. 
but ebpf for some reason does have a lot of go involvement like um, at least loading of the programs and so on um or even monitoring your um, running ebpf programs they they do have libraries that allow you to manage your ebpf programs easily. So I'll stop with this. Um, Watsal had a question, but I think I had answered that by sharing that particular blog. Um, so his question was, um, how does GKE use eBPF under the hood? Um, so if you, anyone actually use Helium or um, even net pod security or network security, um, um, Kubernetes APIs in your clusters, in your Kubernetes clusters, anyone? So Kubernetes has this particular um, network policies as well um, that you can add to your pods. So you can say that this pod is only allowed to talk to this other pod and so on. Um, so you can't really do anything else. Um, that is, you, can, you can't really um, send packets arbitrarily to all pods itself. So it kind of raises um, the security itself. So Cilium does that via eBPF programs, which are loaded onto the um, nodes of your Kubernetes cluster. And um, yeah, um, Google Cloud um, or GKE does use uh, Helium in its data plane. Um, so it does use Helium by default under the hood. So you can use um, Helium network policies, which in turn would get translated to um, eBPF programs under the hood. So this is one other way that eBPF is like Cilium um, does generate, does look at that Kubernetes, um, uh, that YAML file for the Cilium network policy and Cilium cluster wide network policy, um, which are custom resource definitions, which you can add um, and that allows you to. So I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll leave it open for um, discussion, but that's, Pretty much it that I had to share. Okay, baby. So, is there any plan in the future to discuss that? Um, discuss common uh, code design platform. I'm sorry, I can't hear you properly. Right. I'm discussing uh, common code design patterns in the future. Is there ah, common code design patterns. Um, I think there's a good um, course on thing of uh, on go design patterns uh, mm -hmm. but yeah i don't know if we can have a... so are you looking at a application level or are you looking at how to organize code itself better I mean, um, if you have a particular proposal, if you want to chat about it, um, definitely you can uh, you can um, suggest a proposal in the Go study group and uh, that particular repository, and we can perhaps try and schedule one. Um, I can look for some speaker, um, or if not, I can talk about it as well. Okay, fine. Yeah, I will. And to, I will raise kind of issue to go study through uh, regarding this. Oh, I did not know that particular history. I think I messed that up then. Um, so I'm just reading the chat messages between Sandeep and um, Dawal. All right. Uh, I'll not keep you all around longer. Um, thanks, everyone. Sir, yeah, Gaurav, just wanted to ask you one thing. Uh, for our normal uh, Linux distros, uh, we can use SecComp and uh, some other tooling to you know make sure that uh, we can limit the system calls by the user space application. Is this is there anything available for eBPF as well that uh, I do want to run eBPF programs and do want to allow uh, end users to uh, you know use eBPF, uh, but I also want to limit 
their usage. Is there anything like that uh, there in the UPF space? Um, possibly, but or am I not aware of it? No, I'm not aware of it. Actually, to be honest, cool, this is cool. my first time running a EBPF program as well. I'm actually surprised this particular went as smooth as. I was just reading through EBPF's homepage today. It has a it has an article. It has a section about what is EBPF, and based on what I understood, I think EBPF has a verifier system, uh, which verifies that users are not running uh, something crazy. But to your particular question, whether we can limit that. Uh, in the sense you want to restrict somebody from executing a certain system call, not sure if it does that. Pretty sure it doesn't do that. But if security is your concern, then Verifier is uh, trying to take care of it. Yeah, but Verifier yeah, is for Verifier. program success. Right, right, yeah. right. It's the sanity of the program itself, uh, not the logic of the program. Yeah. yeah. So privilege yeah. Is escalation is something that uh, I, I was actually wondering about. There were a couple of talks in RSA and uh, some other, uh, you know, organizations where uh, they talked about how uh, allowing EPPF for programs loading uh, might, uh, you know, create blind space uh, where even if you have a good, uh, you know, malware and antivirus protections and uh, you have uh, great uh, security parameters available with you. Even after that, uh, if you allow EBPF kind of, uh, you know, let's say just for debugging and tracing purposes, and uh, usually we, uh, you know, ops people, sometimes the software engineers as well, we prefer to copy paste code from GitHub or Stack Overflow. That way, there might be a chance that uh, we might have uh, or we might accidentally pull in some malicious code. And when you run it in kernel space, uh, you are actually giving uh, a lot of privilege there. Yeah, so I hope, uh, I, I believe there would be something somewhere. Uh, have I not just find it yet? There is a SecComp uh, uh, privilege, uh, I think, capability called CAP EBPF, if I am not wrong. But that is uh, limiting uh, who can load the program, but not the limitation of the program itself. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think Dharmit cool. dropped off. I thought he would be uh, taking that question. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Gaurav. It was uh, great uh, you know, having this conversation. And uh, I really hope that we can have uh, more such conversations in future, uh, whether it is um, regarding Go or uh, also around EBPA. Yeah, I think we should do a, um EBPA remote study group. <laughs> Let's not create so many different groups. In, uh, we can have a couple of sessions. With no, but I think, um, I think EBPF is one particular technology um, in this particular AI buzz, which is not being looked at as seriously. I agree. I agree. So uh, those who actually have uses, use cases for EBPF, I'm pretty sure they are using EBPF with AI. Uh, they are uh, you know collecting uh, petabytes of data through EBPF and using uh, ML tooling to crunch uh, data out of it and uh, to figure out you know, anomalies and all. So most of the networking optimization and security and observability tooling, it is actually moving towards EBPF. One of the uh, you know uh, joke I heard uh, by one of the vendor is uh, we created EBPF for, because uh, user space was very fat. Now uh, we are actually, you know, uh, adding so much of fat to the kernel itself through eBPF. Yeah. So I'm not sure how long the performance uh, gain that we were talking about will stay. So, Makes sense. Uh, I thought, yeah, that's a good thing to learn and keep in mind. 
I can see that like um, developers shooting themselves in the foot. That's yeah, definitely yeah. going to happen. Happen. So, uh, Gaurav, uh, how can I connect with you uh, outside of this group? Uh, are you uh, active on LinkedIn or some other media? Yeah, I go by Algogrid. So, I think that's LinkedIn.com slash in slash. But I don't. Um, yeah, I suppose. Um, we should start creating more content on LinkedIn itself, um, like better tech content. Yeah, you I'm should sure do I that. Got into, and, uh, got into a political spiral. Are, it happens to everyone. So um, that's the company that um, I am up running. And another way, um, the best way, I think, um, I think just WhatsApp. Like I do uh, post statuses, which are like apparently my LinkedIn is more political than my WhatsApp because my WhatsApp is a little technical. So uh, both are good. Na. Content in any case is good. Uh, I don't mind political content as far as uh, you know the other person is not sucking me into it as well. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So uh, I tried to find you through your uh, this uh, user ID on LinkedIn, but somehow I am not able to find you. Let me just. I've I've shared the, the link. link. Um, LinkedIn dot com. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am just sending you the request. Uh, let's connect it uh, outside of this as well. Sure. Great, great. Yeah. Thanks nice a lot, Gaurav. Well. Uh, yeah. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Um, so, good night. Bye-bye.